Welcome, Alan, to Global Conversations. And it's an honor to have you on our show today because we'll be talking about the science and art of reading people. So how did you get into it? What is the story behind your well, journey? First of all, thanks very much for the invitation to come and chat with you. But uh, I got into reading people mainly because I was very poor at reading people when I was younger. Okay. I um, grew up uh, pretty much as a loner when I was younger on my own, didn't really associate with people very much. But then when I got into my working life, I had to uh, connect with people then, and especially when I was put in charge of people to, uh, to direct them on their duties. And all of a sudden realizing I had no real social skills to start with. So I had to start learning how to read people at that point. And over the years, I've just added more and more skills to where about, well, what would it be now, uh, 13 years ago, I added the uh, ability to read faces, to understand people's personalities from their facial features, and then know their emotions from their body language and facial expressions, and teaching other people how to do the same thing. Right. So how hard is it to read a person's face? Because we could be projecting a lot of emotions at once, and uh, some people are total blank. So how hard mm. is it? It's, uh, it's not really that uh, difficult because the way we look at it is quite simple. When we were children, we were very good at reading people. You know, we needed to be able to recognize them, know, what they, know from their facial features whether we knew them or didn't know them, whether they were somebody that was safe to be around or somebody that we shouldn't be around. And at the same time then, to be able to you know, recognize their emotions as well. So as children, we have the skill. But as we get older, it's like most things. If we don't work at something, like you know, if we speak a particular language, it's not our normal language. We learn that we don't speak it for years. We have to go back and practice it to get the skill back. Riding a push bike, we have to practice it to get that skill back when we, if we haven't ridden a bike for a long period of time. Or muscles, you know, if we lift weights and we've built our body up and we're being fit, and if we're not uh, working out, our muscles atrophy. So all I really do is teach people what they already knew when they were younger. And I just teach people how to then recognize the facial features that you're really not looking at anything other than the dimensions, the ridges of the crevices on the face. And then when the expressions, when I first started to learn those myself, uh, what, 13 odd years ago, I wasn't really good at it at first, but with the great uh, training and guidance I had from the people who were the experts in that field, I very quickly picked it up. It's a skill that uh, you can develop quickly, but remembering that when we uh, take information in, we take so much information in, but we process only a small bit of it. We distort, generalize, and delete a lot of information. And so when we do that, there's a lot of stuff that's wasted. And what we, what we focus on is what we really become better at. So if we're not looking at reading faces when you know, as we're growing up, it just atrophies. So all I do is then teach people how to bring that back, but you can practice it like expressions. You know, we were told when we were growing up, listen to what's being said. We weren't told to watch what's being, or how it's being said. And that's all we're doing is taking people's focus off what's being said in the words to recognizing what's going on in the body language and the expressions on the face. Right, so according to what are the key expressions that give away a person when the person is lying? Well, there's seven expressions, which see the face, first of all, it's got about 43 muscles in the face. It can pull something like 10,000 different expressions, 3,000 uh, expressions that Paul Ekman, his team, a psychologist in San Francisco, California, they did a lot of research on all the expressions and they found about 3,000 that uh, the face can pull. Most people will only, you know, you know, most of their interactions will only pull a couple of hundred but there are seven expressions which are universal. There's anger, contempt, and disgust, happiness and sadness, fear and surprise. If you feel any one of those emotions, you will have that corresponding expression on your face. The cause of the emotion could be due to cultural reasons, but the emotion itself, anger is anger. Anger is somebody's violated your space. They've they come too close or whatever, you're pushing them away from you. And so, or, you know, almost attacking as well. So when you're doing that, whatever you're feeling, if you're feeling anger, 
you'll have the expression on your face, but what causes you to feel angry can be different to person to person. It can be cultural, it could be, you know, different things trigger each of us, but the expression itself is universal. And so there's seven to recognize, but it's not so much the expression, it's the timing of it. It's like if if you had, if you had told me that, um, or I'm, that one of your friends, had, that one of my friends, for instance, had just broken up from their partner and you saw a little twitch of a smile on my face, it means I'm happy. It didn't correlate to what you told me where I told you that other person was a friend of mine. Well, naturally enough, they're not. If I smiled, I'm happy about the fact that they're broken up with their partner. But again, I don't, you don't know why I'm happy. It could be that, yes, they haven't been that good a friend lately and I was quite happy for them to get a bit of a, a kick in the backside, so to speak, uh, that I think that, yeah, they're better off getting away from that other person because they were no good for them. Or it could it even be, oh, that, that friend, that person now who's talking to me is free. And so I've got a chance then of having a relationship with them. So the causes of it can be yeah, quite uh, different, but it just tells you that the expression didn't correlate to what you were expecting to see on the face if that's what the person really felt. Right. So uh, as uh, you were saying that, you know, we show our emotions, whether it's anger, whether it's fear or whether it's happiness. But then, you know, we have politicians and we have government officials who, when they do their uh, media briefings or maybe uh, some uh, sports stars or celebrities, you know, they always remain poised and, you know, uh, like content in themselves or maybe they are taught uh, to be like that. So how do you... Uh, differentiate them well the thing is to well first of all if politicians are giving a speech for instance check the people who are behind them because what they will do is i'll have different party members or part, members of their party behind them but you might notice every now and then that sometimes the people standing behind them change somebody goes out and somebody else comes in because people have learned that we always express because Whatever happens around us or is said around us, in that moment, we respond unconsciously. So if we agree with what the person is saying in front, like the politician is at the microphone, is talking, and the people behind are going like this, they're getting, you know, I'm doing this and you're doing it back to me. So straight away, we have the instance where it's almost like monkey see, monkey do. When other people are doing it, other people will, will follow. So they'll have people behind them who are nodding. But the people behind them only nod because they agree with it. If they don't now agree with what the politician is talking about, I guarantee they will move out the back and somebody else will come in and take their position. Who does agree with the politician? That's so that's something you watching crowds is quite interesting, and especially interviews like that. The other thing is as well is that uh, when they're talking, listen to what they're saying, but really focus on the expressions that are on their face, because that will give away what's really going on. You'll find that if, um, you know, if, if a, a, a uh, interviewer, for instance, asks a question, look at the expression that's on their face. And you'll see, you might sometimes see a little bit of a little raise of one side of the mouth. And so that you know that there's a level of contempt there. And so they didn't like the question that's being asked. Yeah. They didn't like the question that's being asked because they don't want to answer it. And so that's, you know, that's putting them under pressure. Yeah. So it's not just when they're speaking, it's really when other people are asking them questions and talking to them, watch their expressions at that point. Because if they're, going, they're smiling, but it's just a you know, very light little smile, it's a polite smile. You know? You need to see the lines come up around here, they're tightening around the eyes for that person to be really feeling joy. So you look for discrepancies. You're looking for the indicators in what I call clusters. The more things together that are all telling you the same thing, you can then start to trust that. They've got to be congruent. They've got to be in context with what's being said. And so, as I just mentioned, if you had said to me that, one of my friends has just broken up with their partner and you see a little smile on my face, you know that something is out of place from what you would expect because you would have expected to see some sadness from me because my friend is obviously unhappy now. But you've got to ask other questions and that to uh, see what's going on. So listen to the whole conversation and look if there's a rhythm 
that's happening in their expressions with what the questions that are being asked of them. Right. So coming to relationships, uh, even between couples nowadays, uh, you know, two people living under the same roof, they might be leading completely uh, alienated lives, which their partner won't mm. even know that they're having a second life outside. So people can be lying to the face and still living together. So how do you uh, correct that, like through your uh, course or your uh, coaching? How do you deal with that? Well, where I come back to, first of all, is before we worry about looking at whether they're telling the truth or not, is fully understanding whether we understand their personality. You'll find that particular um, uh, facial features, or all the facial features will tell me something about them, but particular differences in facial features between the two parties. Like, say, for instance, somebody who's got an aesthetic appreciation. For them, it's about how things feel inside. So when they've, worked, they've got something on their mind, they will withdraw. They want to be left alone so they can work it out. If their partner has more a dramatic appreciation, which they need to express outwardly, for them, it's the outward expression, whereas the aesthetic appreciation, it's the inward feeling. And so if the one with the aesthetic appreciation starts to go quiet and the dramatic appreciation wants to know what's going on because they need to know what's going on and they don't know how to communicate, this is where the relationships start to break down because while that one wants to know what's going on, the other one's gonna keep moving away further and further. Yeah. And then when the one who, is, who needs to express themselves has something on their mind and they're expressing it, the other one will just say, oh, that's too much energy and I'll move away. So you look for the relationship between the, the couple, first of all. If that's solid, then uh, there's the, the chance that one's cheating on the other is not likely. So I look at the full um, interaction between the couple, not just in this instance, in that situation. How is it all the time? How are they responding? Are they uh, delivering the other person's love language, for instance? If for one, it's um, a physical touch hmm. and all of a sudden that physical touch is not there anymore, you know something's going on. If those words of affirmation aren't being spoken the same way, that gives you a bit of an indication. And that's when, you start looking and uh, getting into a bit more of a conversation to find out what's going on. Because micro expressions, using the, um, uh, the expressions as a lie detector is one thing I like to use as a truth seeker. So when I read people, facial features tell me their personality. I know where I am on the world scale. I know where they are. So I know how I need to change the way I like to be spoken to to match the way they want to be spoken to. And so I can now talk to them in the way that I believe their personality is telling me. Then I've got the body language and expressions that give me the feedback. It will tell me, have I read them right? Is there something emotionally going on? And thirdly, are they telling me the truth when I'm asking them questions? And so I'm using it to find out the truth, not trying to find out whether they're lying to me. Because if you set up to try and find out if your partner is lying, I guarantee you'll find lies, whether they exist or not. So I look at it like build your relationship, communicate with the way that your partner needs to be communicated with. The old saying of, of treat others as uh, you would have them treat you is true to the point of how pe you people respect each other. But when it comes to communication, the more accurate version is treat others as they would have you treat them. And so the more you understand their personality style, the more you talk to that, you'll find that people come together very quickly. And so if there is something going on and may have only just started, it may not have got to the infidelity or anything like that, the whole situation starts to revert back the way it was when they first got together. Right. So it's yeah. using the whole lot because I don't, as I say, if I just want to catch out whether my partner is telling me the truth or not, I'm creating problems. I'm looking for problems. And I've really got to question my motive behind going looking for the problems. What's going on in my mind? Am I looking somewhere else myself in the, in the first point instance? And I'm trying to catch them out so I can blame them and not blame my behavior. Right, that is so true. So hmm. how can we use this communication and uh, profiling in business as well to succeed like through networking or uh, how we learn to read people uh, when we make business partners? Well, I know when I look at you straight away that 
you've got a discerning trait. You like to have a bit of space when you meet people for the first time. Yeah. It's not that you're not friendly. It's that you like to work out who's safe to be around and who's not safe to be around. That's very true. So I know straight away if I come up and meet you, I'm going to not come right up to you because I'm very com uh, comfortable standing close to people. The only people I stand back from are the ones who are very tall because I've got to bend my neck to actually see their face. So I'll, I'm what they call affable. I will step in. Now, every trait's got an upside and every trait's got a downside. The affable one is they'll come and stand close to everybody. And that's the downside as well because they, they stand to people close to people who need a bit of space. They also stand close to the con artists, the people who may be lead, you know, there to lead them astray. So I would come up to you and realise you need some space. I'd stop before I got there. I'd reach out in shaking hands. I'd give you some space. You'd feel comfortable with the space. And now you're listening to what I'm saying. Yeah. If I step in here, you're not listening to anything I'm saying. All you're feeling is my space has been invaded. How do I get some space here? Yeah. That and is so you know, that's just one trait I can see on your face straight away. I also know that when I start talking to you, you want the overview, give you the least amount of information. And from that, you'll make your decision from that. If you want more information, you'll then prefer to ask me for that information. If I just start telling you everything that I think you need to know because I'm more analytical and I need more information to make my decisions, yes, I make a connection with you, but then either you're gonna try and finish my sentences off so you can get to the end of it faster, or you're gonna switch off. So I know just two traits on your face there straight away, give you some space, give you the overview, because if I said to you, you're on this mountain peak, you've got to go to that mountain peak, all you want to know is, how do I, where's the bridge? How do I get from here to here? Whereas an analytical person wants to go down the mountain peak, the mountain across the valley, go up the other side, pick up all the information they possibly can on the way to make sure that where they want to go up there or not. So if uh, you were talking to me then, I would, you know, you'd just give me the overview and I'd probably be interrupting you and saying, hey, come back, what about this? Tell me more about this. You'd be trying to go wide and I'd be going, now come back here and tell me more about this. So if I know that you need to lay it out on the table, I'd say to you, look, you know, just lay it all out. And if you don't mind, I'm going to ask all the questions that I need. And I just come back and I just ask you question after question until I got all the information that I need. And if you know that that's the way I operate, you're not going to feel flustered that, my God, he's asking so many questions. When are we ever going to get to the sale? We'll get into the sale faster because you're talking to me in the way I need to be spoken to. Yeah. And so in sales, it's the first area. If you can read your client, you know how they um, take information in. You know whether they're, they're focused on the value or the service. So you know whether to talk about you know, how wonderful this thing's going to make them feel and what other people are going to think about it and all that. Or... You know, this is a fantastic buy. You're going to, it's the cheapest you'll ever get. It'll give you, re, you know, something you can sell later on. You get good uh, resale value and all those things. And so now you're talking to the person in the language that they need to make a decision based on whether they buy on service or, or value. <coughs> then with your teams. So first of all, with your client, with your, your, um, the sale, you're building instant rapport faster because you talk to their trades. You're building a trust faster. And then with, with that, and because you ask the right questions, you're able to value add to the sale. The person does, you don't really sell to them, but the person is buying from you and they can't wait to come back and buy something else from you. And they go out and tell everybody else how great the sale was that they really got looked after really well. Yeah. So on the sales side, you've got the improvement. Then on the um, your staff side, if you understand people's traits, you know what uh, career, careers will suit them, first of all. Well, as a child's growing up, I can tell you what hobbies and sports will suit them before they get to the age to play those sports or uh, hobbies. We can pick what subjects they should be doing related to the careers that will suit their personality. So they don't go off to university and do a degree that they never end up using because they realise they hate the uh, that profession. But somebody in their wisdom are told them they'll make more money if you go into that uh, industry. So we get them into the right industry and in the, uh, the job, then knowing what tasks will suit them. So are they going to be a team leader type person? If they're a team leader, 
teaching them how to deal with their the team to get the best out of the team. Because we know if staff are, are happy in the work they're doing, and it's just like a love relationship, if they have, if they feel that they've got a place that they belong, that they contribute, that they're valued, they'll work really hard. And staff who are happy in their work are more productive. Staff who feel that they've been micromanaged will find the things that they can get away with not doing and just do the things that they have to do to keep out of trouble and their productivity will therefore have dropped. So micromanagement, always the more you micromanage, the more money you lose in your, in your, in your business with the people who are doing that work. So you're able to find the right task for them. You can do it for building the culture. You can do it for workplace relationships, uh, use it in mediation everywhere. At the end of the day, relationships are the foundation of everything we do in life. And so these to be able to read people fits into every area of life. Finding the right partner in the first place, love partner, keeping that love partner, raising your children, understanding their personality so you can teach them in the way that they need to be uh, taught, knowing what hobbies and sports will suit them as well, guiding them through the right career so that when they go out into the workplace, they're happy at work. If they're happy at work, they're going to come home and they're going to be happy at home. And so their spouse is going to have a better relationship with them and their children are going to be happier. So it doesn't matter where you insert this into the cycles of life through the generations, it works in every area. Right. So before we wrap up our part one, uh, what would you like to uh, give a message to our viewers and listeners about profiling and how can it help us in uh, gaining success in our lives? Well, as I said, the more that you can relate to other people and connect with them and talk to them in the way that they need to be spoken to, the faster you get to know them, you get to like them and you get to trust them. And the more that you have an enjoyable life in that process, because you're having better relationships with the people around you. So I always say to people, there are three rules that you need to learn first. There's seven uh, secrets that I use to reading people. The first three, understand yourself first of all, understand the other person, and then change the way you like to be spoken to to match the way that they want to be spoken to. But always treat others in a way that they would have you treat them, and you'll always move forward. I will give you a, a free gift. My website is alanstevens.com.au. So Alan, A-L-A-N, Stevens, S-T-E-V-E-N-S.com.au. And if you put the forward slash after it, and you just put the word free, F-R-E-E, -E. that will take you to one of my free courses where people can have a test of this for themselves. And they can trial it. There's about three uh, traits that they can learn in there. And it's also a section on where the eyes move when somebody's sourcing information. It'll give you an idea of not so much into the micro expressions, but it's a lead into knowing whether they're telling you the truth or not when you're talking to them. And that's a gift for your listeners. Well, wow. thank you so much, Alan, for being on my show and guiding us through the science and art of reading people. See you uh, next week and have a good day. Thank you very much. Bye for now. Bye.